And so the, the way he does it is he spends most of the time of this chapter on what he calls the unbelievers twin strategies. He says, uh, you know, if we're going on the offensive against unbelief. We ought to know more about it. Remember from previous discussion, he tells us that the unbeliever at some level of his consciousness knows God and knows the truth about God. You know, Romans 1, 21. But the unbeliever suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, Romans tells us. And so he tells us that, uh, you know, he's trying his best to think and live as though the absolute personal God of Scripture did not exist. There are essentially two such ways that the unbeliever attempts to do this. And he says basically these two ways are what he calls rationalism and irrationalism. Or he tells us to put them in a biblical categories atheism and idolatry. So those are the twin strategies that he suggests that the unbeliever attempts to uh, to use. Now, notice he's not saying that the unbeliever is even aware of what they're doing. He's just he's just describing, you know, their particular approach. So we have this rationalism and irrationalism or biblically speaking, atheism and idolatry. And so he's going to spend now the rest of the chapter trying to flesh these, this, these, this twin strategy out so that we can see how this works and how we should deal with it. Right. Uh, he gives uh, Cornelius Van Til credit by saying that uh, Van Til pointed out that the rationalist-irrationalist tension began in the Garden of Eden. Eve would not take God's word as her ultimate authority. She looked at God's speech, Satan's, and her own as uh, though the, tr- the three were all equal, uh, but that is to imply that there is no final truth about anything, which is irrationalism. Nevertheless, when required to choose, Eve claimed the right to decide for herself over against God, autonomous rationalism. He does, she doesn't even make mention to the serpent's uh, point of view. She just says, well, it looks good and it should be fine and grabs it. And from, from there, well, OK, if we become gods and, and uh, me eating this, the, this should be fine. And we see um, the, the, the outcome uh, soon falleth. Yeah, good. He, uh, he says also that the, um, the rationalist, irrationalist dialectic of non-Christian thought bears on ethical reasoning as well as on thinking about other matters. Right. Non-biblical ethics often opposes, he says, absolutes in general, but they forget their opposition to absolutes when they propose their own fundamental ethical principles, such as love and justice, right? So I'm opposed to absolutes. There are no absolutes, but... In my, you know, particular uh, position, right, or my particular pet issue, there are absolutes, right? So there's a, there's a problem. There's a fundamental uh, dichotomy. Mm-hmm. He goes, he gives us the example of Joseph Fletcher. <laughs> he says, um, this is an egregious example, by the way. He says in his book, Situation Ethics, he said, Fletcher, that is, says that for the situationists, there are no rules, none at all. Okay. Oh, but, but short book. Yeah, short yeah book. that's right. Yeah, we can now we can move on. So that's it, right? But he tells us that uh, then, you know, in the same paragraph, Fletcher proposes a general proposition, namely the commandment to love God through the neighbor. Is there a contradiction here between no rules and the rules of love? Well, it sure looks like it, right? <laughs> that's the point he's trying to make. And so Fletcher is a rationalist, he tells us, in rejecting all external ethical absolutes and an irrationalist in that he must cheat to make his approach intelligible. And so what he does here is smuggles in a single ethical absolute in the guise of an ideal, right? So there are none, but here's mine, right? This is kind of the, the, idea, the idea here. And so there's an irrationalist, rationalist kind of uh, problem that he's pointing out with Fletcher's um, ethics. Right. Well, in fact, the history of Western philosophy provides us with many examples of this dance between rationalism and irrationalism. We've covered uh, a a good number of these. Uh, uh, Mitch Stokes' uh, How to Be an Atheist uh, book that we covered uh, that uh, I'll I'll link to below uh, had a a lot of these same types of quotes that that he would find and and, uh, described uh, people's basic philosophies who, who, uh, you know, uh, 
people look to for um, a serious contenders for science and 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 uh, moralist and and uh, rationalist. And you're like, whoa, uh, you know, how can you hold that while also holding a non-belief? These seems either seem contradictory or this seems uh, something that you wouldn't want to say out loud uh, to uh, people at a party. And so um, uh, here he says, in ancient philosophy, the rationalist motif seemed to dominate the scene. In modern times, the uh, irrationalistic motif seems to be uh, largely in control, yet neither exist independently of the other. Uh, for example, Plato combined these motifs explicitly. He was rationalistic about our knowledge of the world of forms and ideas, but irrationalistic about our knowledge of the world of sense experience. His problem was fitting the two worlds together. He couldn't do it. Yeah. And then he's, and he moves on. He says, postmodernism denies that there's any one set of rules, any meta narrative is what he says, for finding the truth. There's a, on this view, uh, a multitude of criteria held by different people, different groups and different settings that may or may not be consistent with one another. And so the claim of objective truth in their somewhat Marxian view is an oppressive claim, he says. Uh, it amounts to oppression, males dominating women, whites dominating blacks, westerns dominating other cultures, rich dominating poor, and so forth. He says in postmodernists, what they want in, to be consistent, they have to deny objective truth, but they should abandon the attempt to persuade others of the truth of their position. In other words, if you're going to deny that there is no objective truth, that it's just, you know, relative in some kind of way, then you have to, uh, to be consistent, apply that same notion to your own position. And so if that's the case, then why should we believe what you say if it's just what you think, just like every other position is what they think, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, they find this problem here. Now, and of course, we've seen this, you know, Piercy famously points this out in Finding Truth uh, that we looked at uh, uh, you know, a while back. But that's a good place to start with this particular issue. Yeah, yeah. Five, five points that uh, are, are fitted together really nicely at, um, at uh, looking at different worldviews. Um, uh, that's a, it's always a good primer that I, I point to uh, college kids that would come up to me in church and ask for a book recommendation for um, um, kind of uh, uh, critiquing or looking at different uh, points of view. And uh, I think she does a phenomenal job in, in that book uh, of, of showing a process and, and laying out the arguments quite well. Yeah, and, and notice the point here is that in order to make their case, they have to exempt their position. <laughs> Right. And of course, that's where the irrationalism comes in. Right. Which is why, I mean, the, the, the thrust of, of, of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, suppression ethics uh, uh, is the goal is to get power. And then once you get power, then you just make the rules and then you just say, no, these are the correct ones. Oh, hold on. I thought there were, weren't any meta narratives. <laughs> yeah. you know, if, if one suppression is the other, then, you know, why, why should, should poor uh, sup suppress the rich and, and why not? And uh, how come, how come when uh, power uh, uh, is, is obtained in those areas, the, the system ap appears to be just the same type of oppression, just with maybe different groups of people. It seems like then there maybe is a, a meta narrative there, or uh, that's that's the the outcome of the worldview uh, that uh, that uh, is held.